it's David Willey, curator from the Tank Museum, still doing questions and answer sessions at home. And here we are with our, can you believe, I think it's 17th uh, question and answer session. And uh, as ever, those of you who know what's going on, you all know what's going on. Those of you who don't, I answer some questions that people have sent in, either in the comments or sent emails to the Tank Museum. And uh, I answer those and at the same time, I try and find a way of flogging you some of the stuff we're selling from our online shop because even though we are now really pleased to say we're open, the numbers are starting to build again as people are coming back into the museum, but as an independent charity, making money to keep us going is so vitally important at the moment. So uh, as I say every time, thank you so much to those of you who have been buying things from our online shop and visiting the museum. I know some of you, I've said hello to some of you have been coming in now. Um, so thank you so much for doing that because that is really helping us and supporting us. And uh, at the same time, if you can't afford anything, well, I hope you just enjoy the content we're putting out for you. So let's get on. And the other one I have to say all the time is the, the dog's here. And uh, I've just come back from a day at work. And so obviously um, the dog is particularly keen that uh, I pay him some attention. So this is Finn running around in the background. So every now and again, I have to throw the ball. Um, right, let's get on with some questions. Mark Voden asked the question, did the M3 Lee Grant tanks see service in Europe um, and how much of the Lee is in the M3 Sherman? So, drop the ball. Uh, good question. Um, so, yes, the M3 Lee slash Grant does see service in Europe, but only not as a gun tank. It sees service obviously in North Africa. It sees service uh, then out in the Far East. Um, in Burma, etc. Um, but it, in Europe, it only sees action not as a gun tank but as a recovery vehicle. The M31 version is an armoured recovery vehicle um, built on the uh, M3 chassis. And there's also a version of the canal defence light that's also built on top of the M3. So that also sees some service in Europe but you don't see the gun tank being used on operations, even though that some of those versions look like they've got, even though they've got a dummy gun in, um, actually they're not used in combat. Um, how much of the M3 is in the Sherman? It's hard to say that definitely, but you've got engines are still in the M4 Sherman. You've got the suspension track systems are in the M4 Sherman. You've got bits of the casting arrangements are obviously going to be developed that then go into the M4 Sherman. So there is a fair old bit there. Compatibility of parts is another whole different area, whether or not any of the things, probably some of the things like the road wheels, etc., cetera, um, track arrangements may well have been able to be used in the, um, in the Sherman. And you have to think of the grant as the Americans did, that this is a work in progress. They needed to get things out. Britain's crying out for armour, we need tanks to train on, we need all that sort of stuff, we need a 75mm gun on a tank, um, that's needed by the Western Allies, but in terms of the actual tank, it's the Sherman they are aiming for, um, and the grant is, you know, in, in all, it's just getting all that turret arrangement organised, everything else for the 75mm um, gun that's going to go into service on the M4, that takes a bit more time. Um, but anyway, but uh, I hope that kind of answers no, but you won't, don't see them in um, fighting combat in their original configurations in the European campaign. Um, Hector, I've just got to say a little word to Hector. Thank you so much. Hector's been saving up his pocket money to buy some of the books from the shop. Well done, Hector, and uh, sensible fellow, and I hope you've enjoyed the books you've actually ordered from the shop. And uh, if I sound like I'm slightly hurrying just a little bit, I know some of you are playing with the, uh, the speed of, uh, of me talking. Slow down, I gather I sound like I'm drunk faster. I sound like some sort of, what's it, chipmunk. But I'm doing that because just as I'm speaking, I'm trying to get it done before the rain, but the rain's starting anyway. So let's see how we go. Um, so well done, Hector, again. Mark Edwards, um, well, I just hope by the time this comes out, you enjoyed your trip down, I hope everything went well with the wife and everything so uh, and thanks for putting your comments on um ajk asks a question about uh an interesting topic that we've touched on a little bit i think before 
um, about what's called Beutpanzers or captured tanks that the Germans use in their service. Now, we had a question before about why the Western Allies didn't do that that much, because they don't. There's one or two quite well recorded exceptions such as Cuckoo, the Panther, but the Germans use a huge number of captured tanks in service to fight um, against whatever f campaign they're fighting at the time. And why is that? And um, the question was really sort of saying, how do they keep those going? What about spare parts, ammunition, etc.? Now, this is an interesting one because when I went to look this up, one of the pointers that uh, we have to sort of separate is when Germany captures the Czechoslovakian arms industry um, after um, 1938-39, they, they, they're getting basically all of that for free intact. So they've got the factories as well, hence they use in 1940 vast numbers of 35 and 38T tanks to supplement their forces. And those factories go on making spare parts, new models, ultimately the Hetzer as we know it. Um, vehicles like that are being made in those factories. The same when you think about it, so they fight in France in 1940, capture large numbers of French tanks, and of course, ultimately gain control of the factories that have made those tanks. So when you're looking at Beutpanzers, the tendency is we sort of see that photograph of a Sherman Firefly with German crosses on the side. They're the exceptions. The rule of thumb is the vast number of the tanks that the Germans are using from other nations are nations that they've either captured the arms industry intact or have got access to the factories. And there is actually, even on the Eastern Front, where they're reusing T-34s, uh, 76s, and then later some 85s, um, there is a point where they're actually, they've captured some of the factory stock as well. And there's a story of them remanufacturing T-34s under their auspices out on, in Russian factories that they've captured and got some of the tooling and some of the spare parts for. So the issue then about spares and ammunition is less of a problem than if you just happen to capture a one-off Sherman and what do we do about the ammunition? Or in North Africa, where you can see the Africa Corps using a number of Matildas and then there's again stories, if you follow those up, they're not in service for long periods of time, but the Germans are always looking out for capturing stocks of ammunition as they were for fuel and everything else. So this idea about stuff sometimes and vehicles swapping sides a number of times, you know, they are the smaller numbers, the vast quantity of the captured tanks used by the Germans in World War II are ones that they've also got access to the factories and spare parts and manufacturing. But they do, and again, in some areas, you know, you can't, there's about 600 British vehicles, they think about 300 put back into service, um, so you'll see them as bases. So in some of these, they are obviously using ones where they haven't got access to the factories, whether they're making, as most of the German, you know, a lot of their repair stuff is doing bespoke. It doesn't all, you know, have this massive supply chain like the American and the Allies have. Um, so they are making things and trying to have to cobble stuff together, but they are also doing things because in 1940, they captured a considerable number of 3.7 um, British anti-aircraft guns. They put those into service in the, for German air defense and they remanufacture ammunition just to fit the 3.7, so they put that into production. Now, whether they do that with any other tank ammunition for those captured British tanks, I'm not sure, I doubt myself, but where they've got something that is so fundamentally useful to the defense of the Reich, like a fair large number of 3.7 anti-aircraft guns, they are obviously, they thought that was worthwhile remanufacturing the ammunition there. So, um, that's one of those big problem ones, but when you think about it, it's slightly different that's one of those arguments where, yes, the Russians used some captured German equipment, etc., when they were getting fairly desperate, but on the whole, the Western Allies didn't see the need and they saw the risk as too great um, of blue-on-blue -blue incidents because actually just because you've captured that tank, um, not everyone's going to pick up on the markings, etc., and there's, you know, that very distinctive, they're the bad guys, we're going to fire at them and, you know, not, not consider too much um, uh, about the fact it might be a captured vehicle in our service. So I hope that answers that one. And I did actually dig out when I was looking for the, um, some of the commentaries on there. There's, um, I picked up this bit here, which um, there's a lot of details about how they were getting um, the French to remanufacture parts and complete vehicles at some of the uh, Billancourt 
and the fact that there was bombing that went on there and the fact that again you know we just talk about the tanks but of course they're then using those French factories to manufacture uh, trucks, supply vehicles, all sorts of bits and pieces and some of the figures are just outstanding um, that I was I just took a couple of photographs on that and the other issue about the Germans as well they couldn't leave well alone so some of the vehicles they're getting um, in the, the reports they're saying that of course the troops are um, have always been encouraged that the German equipment's better having these other ones how do they use them tactically are there other things and one of the criticisms that a lot of them have about the french tanks is visibility hence you'll notice new cupolas being placed or extra vision equipment placed on some of the captured char bees um, and how they adjust things and there's some things they're bound to you know for like for radio equipment they need needed different systems etc um, but that idea or where they add on armor like our char bee has got changes on it because it was captured from the French, put into German service. So there is that tendency for them to not just take it straight into service. They have a little bit of a fiddle with it as well. Um, right, next question. Um, I think it's the name Amazing Ace. Our question, why is our Char FT in black? Um, I've been asked this a number of times before. That, when the original research was done on that, by what's now the Weald Foundation, where they were doing some, they borrowed some parts for the restoration of two FT tanks um, that they were doing up in, uh, in Kent. That was what was believed to be, and I still believe that's the case, um, the color of the tanks for those ones that were in basically their training tanks. They are non-armored. There was about, I think about 50 of them were put together by the French, not proper armor plate, but they were used for training and that is supposed to be the colour. We always remember it from that lovely sort of French greyish colour that was there before. Um, but again, that's another one that um, I'd be interested to, again, in due course, finding, because we did the, a lot of paint scrapes were done, etc., and the evidence behind that one. But that is the answer. It is supposed to be the colour that those tanks were in. Um, right. Um, OK, mixed content asks a question. How comfortable was it in tanks, or how comfortable are tanks? And uh, this is one of those ones where ergonomics, in other words, what it feels like to operate, use, and fatigue in tanks, has been studied by, um, you know, early days it was, you just have to lump it, but don't forget a First World War tank wasn't supposed to be in action that long. Um, how it's developed to try and, in the Second World War studies, about what makes a tank uh, easier to operate, easier to drive, better in combat, um, what's less fatiguing for the crews, etc. Let's not kid ourselves, whatever they seem to have done, um, these are still hugely stressful things to drive, physically demanding in most cases, and uh, for most of us, uh, we'd be finding it, you, you know, uh, we, it's almost the opposite to well ergonomically designed. There's bits poking out at you, you're supposed to squeeze in spaces, you've got all sorts of bits of equipment all over the place. And uh, I thought just a quick summary of that, there's quite a good little line in this book, Second World War Through Soldiers' Eyes, one of those books we're selling in the shop at the moment, um, nice and cheap I think it is, but good little summaries of all the different types of things, what it was like for a British soldier, and he just does a bit on armour guys here, and he said, um, I'll just read you what he says here, although designs varied, conditions inside most tanks and armoured vehicles were uncomfortable, smelly and claustrophobic particularly when the hatches were battened down under fire, with crews relying on periscopes for observation. Ken Tao to Sherman tank gunner with the Northamptonshire Yeomanry was wedged in the turret when in action, much in the manner of, quote, a Victorian boy suite jammed inside a dark tight, tight flue. Trooper Dennis Bunn drove a Humber armoured car with the 15th Scottish Division and recounted the, the inside the vehicle he experienced intense heat and darkness while he gripped the steering wheel and peered through a small aperture at the ground in front. Fighting in North Africa, an NCO from 3RTR described conditions inside his tank as, quote, stinking and thick with cordite fumes from the two guns going hammer and tongs, and our eyes were red-rimmed and streamlined. You could taste the explosive. Um, and they go on, and there's some good descriptions. One of those books I'd recommend, Second World War Through Soldier's Eyes, we've got it. By the way, I know some of you are saying, hang on a second, I've been following the link above, and it go to the Tank Museum website and then go to the shop. I believe the one that's on YouTube just takes you to a few t-shirts or something, but that's um, worth reading there. Um, no tank is comfy and uh, we've had the experience as well. You watch 
the guys get out some of the vehicles. Some of them, the airflow just takes all the muck and dust straight through the visors or the vision ports at the front where the driver is. Um, I mentioned before when we were doing that driving, not that long driving, but perhaps longer than we usually do, a couple of hours at a time out in Holland, the amount of muck and dust that was getting in your eyes. I was driving a dingo there, but the other guys driving tanks, how tired you were just by the physicality of the driving of those uh, things like a Sherman with all the stick and the gear changing, and also how everyone ended up getting really sore eyes. And I mentioned before, because we were in column quite a bit of time, the amount of fumes you were taking in from the vehicles in front, you know, you really notice that sort of carbon monoxide, slightly sicky feeling at the end of a, of a longer drive. So um, how can I put it? No tanks comfortable. That's all there is to it. Um, right. As um, the rain's getting a bit heavier, I will be speeding up. Um, somebody asked a question about um, saying about uh, Deborah, the tank that was found in France. Um, it wasn't me, it was David Fletcher who found the image that connected the picture of the wreck tank when it was first discovered with the tank or the bus as they called it then of Second Lieutenant Heap who was the chap who was actually in command of the tank and survives. Um, and so that was a connection there but um, again there was a link there in your question which is in the comments section um, to a talk on the discovery of Deborah um, that was done for the Western Front Association. Some really interesting stuff coming out on that particular tank. And one of those great things is uh, which Philippe Gorzinski and the team there has done over time, which is tracking down the families of those who served in that tank where they were killed and some of the, um, you know, the commanding officers, etc. And that idea of giving that picture of how one little tank, one crew of eight men, how that's affected people all those years later. And the amazing thing about Deborah is, again, if you get the chance to see her, a female Mark IV tank from Cambrai, um, great story behind it in its new museum out at Flecquier, out in France near Cambrai. Um, so that, that's, again, is another great, great story there. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, congratulations, all I can say to people like Philippe, who've, who's done all that work all over the years and seen that to fruition that, that, that everyone else can see her now. Um, Kiro the Avenger asks the question, what about engagement protocols? Um, I can't do every country, even though if you go, the German ones are published from World War II. What's, what's an engagement protocol? How is it that a commander says to his tank crew when an enemy is sighted, what's the order? Because when you think about this, this is why tank crews go through all that training, why there is such an importance given on uh, response to an order quickly, efficiency in the right order, no fumbling around, no messing about and everything. And what you're taught, but also in action, you'll see how that's adapted to the circumstances. But I, I had the chance today, because I was in the office, went in the archive, and I dug out um, a couple of British versions of what those orders were. And this is from December 44, when they're starting to issue the Comet tank. And this is what, under section 16 of the um, armament guide, drop it, uh, under section 16 in the armament guide, it's we've got what they are calling fire discipline. So what happens is, first of all, if you're firing, and there's different sections for the different types of ammunition type, but the assumption is you're coming across a German tank, therefore firing AP, armour piercing. Driver right, OK, halt, 77 shot action. That's what he's saying. And then the commander will be then saying, traverse left, he is then getting the gunner to aim accurately. So he says, traverse left, and assuming it's left, steady on. And that's what he's doing through the throat mic to the gunner. So the gunner is then picking up the target that the commander is seeing. On is when the gun is at the actual um, aiming at the uh, target. The commander then gives an estimate, 800. So, the, and again, in the notes there, this is explaining it. Range expressed in hundreds of yards, exact multiples of 100 or 1,000 are expressed thus. 400 is 4,000. Um, yes, that's right. Um, 
and then he will then state the nature of the target. So here, of course, it's operations World War II, so he's saying panther, tiger, etc. So again, there's a good chance the gunner will, be, will recognise what the target is that he, the commander's trying to get him to aim at, and therefore also know if it's a panther, is it better to try and aim for the side, or if it's a tiger, you know, good luck, but aim for the side. Um, so um, you, you're, you're aiming for what you know, whereas again, if the commander's suggesting it's a, I don't know, Panzer three. the 77 on that comet should go through pretty much any part of it. Um, and then uh, the commander will, or, will give the order fire. Um, and there's how he does corrections, left half target, up half target, go on. Um, and uh, again, how he's go going through sort of corrections on these things as he's doing that. And there's different fire orders for HE. Um, now, I also found another one which was um, from an earlier manual that was talking about um, how you would actually fire at a uh, using a three inch howitzer. I thought I'd just give you this one. Whereas again, you can see these are changing. Um, he says action. Um, and then at this particular point, the gunner will unlock, will make sure the gun's ready for firing. Um, the Gunner, the commander will then give the order, well, he'll tap, and again, there's, I, I can't read all the details, sorry, I'm just not doing this very well, am I, but there's lots of little details about what they're all supposed to be doing. So, for example, um, he will tap the gunner when the howitzer is loaded, fire, the gunner will either fire the weapon as ordered, the loader will then feed the weapon, stop, it means both weapons, that means the main gun and the machine gun, you should stop firing, unload if the firing is not necessarily now um, and then normally on range work as well they say at the end clear guns now that all looks fairly basic that way but there is an operating procedure but what you'll find is each crew will come to yes they will have to do the basics because that's got to be done you know as in on fire um, nature of target etc how many yards because the commander quite often has a better vision um, to be able to help the gunner do that and to correct his shot but you'll find in different circumstances, different methods are being used. So for example, in the desert, there was this um, scoot and shoot method where they would charge towards the enemy. The gunner was asked to try and keep the enemy target within his crosshairs in his sight, but was allowed, basically the minute the tank, the commander said stop, as soon as the gunner thought he was on target, he was allowed to fire and the scoot bit is then you move off quickly. And that was because at certain points in the desert, especially if you're things like a Stuart tank or you're in a, a, a two pounder armed against perhaps a, a Mark III or a Mark IV special out in the desert, you need to be keeping your mobility up because you know you can't have, you've got to get closer to fire. So you need to move again quickly. So none of this slugging that out moment sort of stuff. So that was a, a shoot and scoot type of uh, firing. So they changed the fire orders there. Um, so that all sounds a bit, sort of waffly I'm sorry about that but but basically yes each country comes up with slightly different fire orders but you can see what the principle is going to be and you can also see how a seasoned crew are going to sort out the language on doing that and I always remember read, uh, also you know what round for example we were being asked what's the round if your point tank that they always carry um, again different units different times came up with different theories about how you should be doing this and I spoke to Reg Smith Spittles who was in a Cromwell quite often because he was the older corporal at 22 in charge when he was on point he said in the end I realized smoke was the best round to carry because quite often uh, if they come around the corner and they're fired at being the lead tank that they, they may well be then he was saying his fire orders were always going to be smoke first in a general direction because he believed that number one, the chance of that first round and even seeing where the first enemy fire came from, especially if it's something like a hidden anti-tank gun, um, was going to be pretty lucky if you were going to see where it fired from. And uh, so by firing smoke, there was a chance, number one, once the smoke spread, it would uh, disrupt the vision if it's spreading at all sort of stuff, if it's in the general direction of where the enemy were. And number two, he also believed that it might make people shift or move, or if it's something like a tank or a self-propelled gun, um, smoke might mean to them they're about to get a barrage on them or maybe even an air um, attack as well. So his, his theory after going through a fair number of combats 
was that his best first round in the barrel um, was going to be smoke um, because that's another thing because quite often as we all know um, the first round fired in a tank versus tank engagement or tank versus anti-tank gun tends to be the one that uh, that that leads the engagement in other words if you're the one in in hiding and you get the first round off it's much more likely you're going to be victorious in that engagement right i hope that answers that one um uh, stone phillips i think the name is asks are we going to do a panzer four tank chat just the other day i did a panzer four tank chat so hold off and they'll be take a little while but they'll be coming up so we'll be doing panzer four tank chat soon um Someone called Baldy asks, what's the V on the front of a T-72 for? What you were speculating, you're right, it is a kind of um, to break the bow wave when you're going through water. That's what that V is at the front. Um, somebody also says there's a, sometimes on tanks, when you look at them, they've got ridges. That's also to stop bullet splash. Sometimes they put metal bars on as well, stop bullets. So if it's hit, it's not skidding up towards the optics. There's more chance of it being stopped, which is why sometimes around optics in the turret, you'll see a stepped front going into the optic, not a smooth one. So it doesn't direct the round into the optic there, but there's more chance of it stopping it. Um, but that V you're looking at on the front of a T-72. And if you look on a number of vehicles, especially those that are designed for deep waving, wading or even amphibious, um, sorry, it's raining a bit more. I don't know if you're seeing any of this, but everything's getting a bit wet. I'll be a bit, bit careful in a moment. Um, yeah, so if you're, um, yeah, so if you're an amphibious field, think of a BRDM2. They actually have a board, a splashboard on the front that can be deployed forward. And again, the same idea there is to stop a bow wave if you get moving too quickly or you know there's some some uh, disturbance on the water too much of it coming over the front and actually swamping through hatches etc um, so you'll see that on a number of different vehicle uh, t54 t55 straight board across the front um, uh, and, and that again same idea so the water does, just doesn't come straight up over and into the guy's hatch um, it's getting slightly heavier even if you can't see it so i better um, speed a little bit further on and actually get going um yeah i think actually that's probably the questions i will answer this time around um but as i was saying do keep those questions coming uh, my uh book's getting a bit i can hardly read some of them now because it's the uh, the water's um making all the ink run i think i've answered those questions i was going to in there but i hear you say what about all those wonderful products you've got in front of you now i know someone asked a question is there anything good in terms of a book on tortoise where people are interested in tortoise? Um, I don't know of one. I know it does appear in a number of the um, volumes that are more collected ones on post-war or wartime, assault guns, etc. Um, but there's nothing specific I can re recommend there. But I can recommend if you're particularly keen on tortoise. Here's a lovely model that we did have in stock, I gather, some time ago. Uh, Meng models, beautiful one there, A39 Tortoise. Um, so if you're particularly keen, we have that one in the shop for you model makers. Um, and I believe I also had, where are we? Um, there we are, that was another one of these Meng models. Look at that, um, a lovely one of our Rolls-Royce armoured car. This one, the First World War, um, ours, don't forget, is um, we've got a 1920 pattern that, that you can build either a 14 or a 20 pattern on that one. So another one there. Those of you who like your um, Lego, that's the, um, what do they call them? Brickmania Tiger. Um, so you can make up your own Tiger out of Lego bits. And uh, what were the other things I was going to show you here? I know a number of you are still buying the Tank Museum socks. Well done. But if you are a hosiery bit of a fan, we also do, amongst other products, a whole series of... They are Dad's Army socks, as, and we've got quite a bit of Dad's Army stuff. If you don't know what Dad's Army are, because you're not British, it's going to be a really hard one, but it's basically about a Home Guard unit in the Second World War that was a British television series that was an absolute classic. It's repeated on British television to this day and quite worthily so because it, it is beautiful, gentle humour, captures the time rather well and has gone down with some of its catchphrases into English all the time. Hence, don't panic, etc. Um, so there you've got uh, socks that way or if you really fancy, you can get a don't panic set with goodness knows what the other colour ones are, but MTP pattern socks as well. So for you hosiery fans, you can get your dad's army. Um, don't panic bigger mug. You can get a smaller mug. Um, you can get a ring for rations bell that's in there, um, tin mug, 
even stupid boy, which was another one of the um, catchphrases, one socks there. So, uh, and a stress hand grenade for um, squeezing, which is soft and foamy or something or other. So if you're a Dad's Army fan, or even if you're not a Dad's Army fan, but you fancy buying one of those for somebody, um, there's that lot there. I did mention about some of the books, Second World War Through Soldier's Eyes. That's one of the ones we've got. Um, those of you who've come back and said, you're absolutely right, even I was staggered at how cheap. We have got the Haynes Manual on the Churchill tank for £2.99. These smaller icon ones, as I've said before, it's the same as the bigger versions, all the same text, it's just printed on a smaller format, so it's all still in there. £2.99, for goodness sake, there is so much good stuff in that one. And uh, I was also told £4.99, the Panhard Armoured Car, which I know I've mentioned that one before, but do have a look on the website, because there's quite a few there. But how another country goes about it, that's another one that I found interesting on the uh, for the Panhard one there. Um, if you're, uh, if you fancy your MTP, uh, multi-terrain pattern camouflage, um, Bed sheets or single duvet cover, they, we have those in the uh, shop as well for, uh, I was about to say for the kids' bedroom, but I bet all the blokes would probably be quite happy to be hiding away under that. Or oh, what a great backdrop for, you know, when you're doing with your models, of course. So if you're not a model maker, but you like models, we've got some of those really nice ready-made ones. So there's a king tiger there, there's a tiger one. Have a look again on there. These are these ones that are actually, I think they're resin and metal, um, but, but very well, beautifully detailed models. So, uh, of course, and they'd be perfect for going over your MTP bed clothes and duvet cover, you know, when you're doing all your, your tank battles up in the bedroom when no one else is around. Um, other ones, other some other books I uh, thought, I did have a look at this one as well. And again, I won't go on about it now. And actually, amazingly, the rain stopped a little bit. Um, but when I was looking at this one, this is another one, £2.99, RAF Escapers and Evaders in World War II. And uh, I was taken, I don't know what it is about this, but there's photographs in there. It's a very well written and um, nicely illustrated book. But I was looking at the photographs of these young RAF officers and uh, all these ones, how they got away and how they went back sometimes to meet the people, the resistance, the people that were helping hide them, the people that helped get them over the Pyrenees, etc. And there's some photographs in here. Um, this guy... Um, where are we? Um, squadron leader Gordon Carter, and there's a photograph of him, you know, these dashing RAF pilots look alike and everything. And the woman who rescues him, okay, I don't know if you can see that gentleman, um, ladies as well, but uh, anyway, quite understandably, he falls in love with her. And the good news is he survives the war and goes back and marries her afterwards. So how can you not resist a book telling you stories like that? So that's one of them there. Um, if you're into your air ships, aeroplanes and uh, various other things, that's a, a book we got there, 2 99 all about an airship station, uh, King's North Airship Station. And again, you know, I know some of you've got areas of interest. Another one of those peculiar ones, uh, Lost in Shangri-La, plane goes down. Um, and it's this ridiculous amount of uh, the fact they're in the middle of Borneo where there weren't other people around at the time and having to befriend local tribes and have tribes after them as well and how finally they're rescued, a nurse and two, uh, two of the guys in the plane. Just one of those, another one of these amazing stories that comes out later, um, even though it was actually quite well recorded at the time. Um, 2 99 so, you know, another one there. And one I know a couple of you have bought and said how good it is. Gallipoli Sniper, um, so it's a memoirs of, uh, well it's not the memoirs, it's, it's about a guy called Billy Singh and I was reading some of the accounts there but what it was like in Gallipoli, um, this sort of constant battle between the, um, the snipers of both sides, so again go and have a look on the website, again I know some of you have tried to order things before and thought the postage, whatever, we've been working on that and also some of the prices have been changing and stuff as well has been restocked so if you are after things. So those of you, um, there we go, one of those classic um, cat barges, Death or Glory Boys. Um, so we've got their t-shirt, oh and that was the other one, sorry, as amongst countless other t-shirts no doubt. You can see our lovely inflatable shells down the front and uh, here we go again, if you're going for your MTP duvet cover why not get yourself a little £2.99 MTP lamp, bedside lamp there. So um, there we go, um, another one of these things. Um, what are the other things? I've always mentioned our 88mm shell and our 17-pounder inflatable shell. And uh, one of the veterans from uh, who was a 17-pounder gunner in a firefly in World War II, Ernie Slarks, he sent his photo in holding one of those sort of thing, and he was proud as plunge to get one. So um, And best of luck, Ernie. So um, it's good to, good to know you're going strong. 
Um, our little model tanks, if you fancy your desk ornament or whatever it is. So we got, what have we got? Tiger Centurion Chieftain Mark IV, First World War I hiding there. Um, so you've got those ones as well. If you're, I gather, I was looking on a news article, apparently in lockdown, everyone's been eating, drinking lots of tea and eating lots of biscuits. So you can get your orange crunch biscuits with a Tiger tank on or your chocolate chip shortbread with a Chieftain on. Um, if you fancy one of those ones. And of course, because we have Tiger Day, all our Tiger Day products. So if you fancy your Tiger Day mug, um, we've got magnets, we've got chocolate, we've got fridge magnets, we've got even if you're, you know, whatever you want to pop on. So even if you've been to a previous Tiger Day, you might want to remind yourself of a Tiger Day by having something like that. Now, have I done everything? No, I haven't. I hear you say, what's this weird one at the back covered in rain at the moment? Um, you can get yourself well, I can only describe as what looked like some sort of um, RPG slash something or other, but it can fire little foam balls eight metres. So I was told I could get this out, but I won't at the moment because the minute I start firing those balls around, you know Finn's going to be eating them and ripping them apart and uh, having a whale of a time with them. And uh, he's quite happy enough, I think, with a, with a tennis ball most of the time. And of course, if you really do want a Finn toy, We've still got the plush toys and uh, you can get yourself a Finn puppet um, if you're that way inclined. So I think he says I've covered all the stuff. Thank you as ever. If you are following us, thank you for all the nice comments. Thank you for the, um, I do pass them on to Finn at the right time. He's, he's got over the jigsaw puzzle bit, but uh, I think he's going to work out what he does next. I will say thank you as ever. And uh, I hope all's going well with you and uh, keep sending in the questions as I say. We. Um, we didn't have that many this time, so if you do have questions, and I would say just at the end, there's one or two questions. I'm just never going to be answering questions about secret armour, um, about what you can do with it or what, where it works and where it doesn't work okay, because it is secret for a reason. And the last thing we want to be doing is telling anybody that accidentally gives it to the bad guys uh, about secret armour. So desist on the, um, the Chobham armour ones, because we've kind of said as much as we can on Chobham. Um, here's to you. Oh, and drink some. Don't forget you can get your um, Centurion Cider or all the other ones, Little Willy Bear, all the other stuff from us too. Right, Finn, tea time. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop. Uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organisation and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.